welcome to the latest episode of the Making Liam Fly podcast. And this one, as all of them, is, is a very interesting one. It's called Six Sigma, The Myths and Realities. And to make this really as successful as possible, we've invited some great guests, two of my colleagues within GK and Aerospace, but also um, an ex-colleague and friend, Mark Sneeringer. Um, and, and all of them will uh, introduce themselves very soon. And you'll realize that they're absolutely the right people to talk about this subject. So the abstract for this uh, episode is that Six Sigma is a well-known improvement methodology, first made famous by Motorola and GE, and now ubiquitous across industry. However, there are a lot of myths around Six Sigma. Is it a, a philosophy? Is it a strategy? Is it a methodology? Or is it a tool? Is Six Sigma Demaic? Is Six Sigma DFSS? Should we use Six Sigma or Lean? This episode of the podcast aims to eradicate some of the myths and elucidate the realities with three eminent guests and masters in this field. So without further ado, let's um, let's talk about who we're talking to today. So let's start with Edwin, a, a, a usual guest on this uh, podcast. Welcome, Edwin. Thanks, Philip. Uh, for those that, uh, that don't know, Edwin van der Berg, um, I am very proud to be leading the Lean Academy uh, within GK and Aerospace. And as part of that, I also head up the Six Sigma program within uh, GKN. Um, I've been, uh, I'm, I've started as a, a mechanical engineer, uh, done some design work, and then went into manufacturing. And I first encountered Lean and Six Sigma at the same time in Royal Phillips Electronics in 2005. Um, got my Six Sigma Black Belt Certificate in 2009, and then took another, what is it, seven years to become a Master Black Belt. Um, but I've always really enjoyed the Six Sigma methodology and uh, look forward to, uh, to uh, going through this uh, podcast with you all. Thank you, Edwin. Great to have you on, as always. And then next, maybe uh, Nick, um, you introduce yourself, please. Yep, Philip. Thank you, Nick Walters. Uh, currently, I'm the uh, global master black belt for the defense business line in GKN Aerospace. Um, it's been about 20 years in manufacturing. Uh, most of my professional career was with uh, Kraft Foods at their flagship facility in uh, Illinois. Uh, I started at Kraft as an operator, working on the floor my uh, second week out of high school and uh, worked my way up into roles of increasing responsibility through Kraft. Kraft is where I was uh, first introduced to Six Sigma. I uh, got my green belt and my black belt through, uh, through Kraft. Um, spent a lot of time in the food manufacturing realm then before I moved to Solo Cup where I was a quality assurance and uh, operational excellence manager for Solo Cup. Everyone in the U.S. is familiar with the uh, the red Solo Cup product. Uh, from there, I uh, spent some time in the window and door industry, worked for Geldwin Windows and Doors, so a uh, completely different industry from food and, and food packaging. So I guess throughout my career, I've had the opportunity to see how Six Sigma can be applied to many different types of industries and manufacturing. And, uh, and now I'm very much happy to be applying it in the aerospace industry. Just a little bit about me. Thanks very much, Nick. Great, great to have you on. And I think many people around the world know Solo Cup, um, having watched American Pie. So, oh um, yeah, <laughs> we all know the red, uh, the red beer pong cups as the known. I think uh, outside. That's of it. Uh, thank you. And then, last but not least, Mark, welcome. Oh, hi, I'm Mark Sneeringer. Um, I'm semi-retired. I'm doing a bit of uh, continuous improvement and uh, uh, new product introduction process consulting. My last full-time job uh, was I was the continuous improvement leader for Philips Healthcare Division. Um, that uh, ended in 2016. Uh, I got involved in Six Sigma when I was working at GE. I was actually at the GE Research Labs at the time and uh, was part of the second group of master black belts that got trained by Michael Harry uh, there at uh, there at GE. Went on to become um, well, uh, rolling out design for Six Sigma across GE and then was the uh, DFSS and reliability leader for their appliance business before joining Philips. Um, in their North America sales operation for uh, for healthcare, um, 
couple different roles in in Philips, including working with the uh, as a program manager and quality leader for the uh, for the Sonicare business, the oral healthcare business, uh, which is I think when I met Philip and uh, and Edwin, and um, as I said, I ended up last role there as the CI leader for the healthcare division. Great, thanks very much, Mark, and uh, hopefully the the listeners or uh, watchers viewers. Um, can recognise that we've got three real experts here in, in Six Sigma, and uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, to you sharing your your experiences and knowledge. So let's jump into it then. So, you know, first of all, I think it's it's good to define the subject that we're talking about. So what is Six Sigma? Um, I'm, I'm going to put you on the spot with this one, Edwin. What is Six Sigma? Well, if you if you take Six Sigma as a as a term in itself, it's a it's a quality indicator for the quality that a process has. So if you run a process multiple times, you get outputs, and all of those outputs should be exactly the same. In reality, they're not. So you get a distribution of outputs, and in many cases, in most cases, those follow a standard distribution known in the statistical arena as the normal distribution. Now, what you want to have is you want to have a, as little spread as, as possible around that mean, and that mean should be on target. If you have a little bit of spread, um, the uh, the standard deviation is, is uh, the terminology used to define that spread. And if you have a really high quality process, you're making sure that that spread is very small if you compare it to the customer specification limits. And if you can keep it extremely small and the, the measure for it is six times um, that distance to the first sp customer specification limit that you hit for the mean of that process. That means that you have a six sigma quality level process. And in reality, that means you hardly have any defects. Chances of having a defect the next time you run your process are three in a million. Yeah, thank you. I mean, that's a really good way of, of defining it, Edwin, and I think basically the, the the ethos of it potentially is that what we're trying to do is to make sure that the quality of the product or service, and, and I think the service part of it's interesting that we can talk about in a bit, a product or service will deliver on the vast majority Um, and, and obviously there's a lot of statistics around ensuring that that happens. But from a customer's perspective, they want to ensure that they can almost guarantee they're going to get the service or product that they require. <laughs> so that's uh, I think that's that's really important. And, and I think that was an interesting thing that you defined, you know, the difference between maybe we use a shortened terminology in terms of we talk about Six Sigma, but we're actually talking about a methodology that delivers Six Sigma quality levels, aren't we? So, so Mark, maybe you can build on that and, and talk maybe about some of the history behind how, how this was developed. Yeah, so so as, as you said, it's a methodology and um, it grew, you know, grew out of Mot Motorola where they started looking at this and trying to um, you know to to describe the processes in in terms of these statistical um, the statistical as aspects of mean and standard deviation and that sort of thing. Um, it grew then beyond there, uh, probably into allied signal and to, and into GE were two of the early adopters and uh, and from there, because of the you know the the importance of somebody like Jack Welch saying, this is what we want to do. It sort of exploded in the late nineties, I would say is when the, um, when it was probably at its, at its fastest growth rate. And, um, and it's, and then at the, about the same time uh, you had design for Six Sigma sort of come along, build on the, uh, on the Six Sigma methodology, but expanded into, say, new product development, that sort of thing. And from there, um, there it's it's just it's it's got had its ups and downs. I think since then, um, there's uh, there's folks that are are zealots about it. There are folks that are people that don't believe at all in it, and there are uh, and there are the rest of us who understand when it's useful and how to use it. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. I think that that segues really nicely as well, uh, 
Mark, into my next question, which I'm going to direct towards you, Nick, which is, you know, why do we need to use Six Sigma or the Six Sigma methodology? I guess Edwin's touched on it a little bit, but why why is there not kind of, let's say, less complicated methodologies of, to, to achieve high quality levels? What Why do we need to use this, Nick? Yeah, you know, I think when as manufacturing evolves throughout the, the 2020s and, and beyond, it's it's increasingly more important for organizations to be intimate with their processes and 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 really know and understand what their processes are are telling them. And our processes speak through through data. And if we want to stay agile, uh, we want to stay ahead of, of competition, this intimacy with your process needs to be very, very well understood uh, at the senior leadership level, the engineering levels, et cetera, et cetera. So if we don't stay on top of that, if, if we don't understand what our processes are telling us, uh, our opportunities to improve, our opportunities to uh, to get a leg up on competition uh, won't be there and, and organizations will continue to fall further and further behind. Um, so understanding our processes and understanding our data, thus then translating that into, into Six Sigma projects, Six Sigma initiatives, is, is how we stay ahead. Um, it's, it's how we continue to improve, how we continue to, to use this advanced problem-solving techniques uh, to get better, to continue to deliver quality product, to push quality product all the way to the edge where the customer is fully satisfied, uh, to push delivery times uh, to to an area where the customer is fully satisfied. I don't think we can do that unless we truly are intimate with our processes, and that's what Six Sigma uh, allows us to do. The digestion of the data, uh, breaking that down into in, into the advanced problem solving required to do the Six Sigma project. Yeah, excellent. Thanks, uh, thanks, Nick. And I, I think again, as you were talking about that, it prompted a another question, which I, you know, maybe I'll direct towards Mark, which is, you know, Nick mentioned manufacturing processes. I mentioned earlier, or, or I think Edwin might have mentioned manufacturing and service. You know. How would you apply Six Sigma to a service? I think maybe most people can um, picture, you know, a manufacturing process, you know, widgets dropping off the end and you measure the output and you can start to calculate what your variation or standard deviation is. How, how would you apply this to a service environment, Mark? So so I would, I think of it in terms of like a manufacturing process versus a transactional process. So in the service area, you're you're it's transactional, but it's still a process. And so there's things you can measure about it, things you should measure about it, and you're going to see variation and you're going to see off off target performance on those measurements that you do on that service. So let's say you're running a call center and it's uh, it's you know how how long does it take you to get to a solution for the customer or your it's a delivery process and what's your on time delivery like and so so those sorts of things uh, what you find a lot of times though is those processes there's not a lot of ready data to start working with and so what you need to do is is as the first part of the process or the first part of the solving the problem is gather those data but the data are there and uh, just like they are in a manufacturing process and so it's it's getting those data applying the tools to them and the, and as you apply the tools then that sort of exposes what the solutions can be to um to you know to improve those those transactional or a service process for instance Brilliant. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. I appreciate that. So if, if I think about that, you know, I just I think it's a really interesting uh, element around the service part of it. So if I think about something like recruitment, for example, Edwin, if, if you've got a recruitment process and, you know, you, you, you look at how long it takes you to hire people, you know, the number of recruits you need to get for every one successful hire and then, you could look, I guess, at the retention of people once you brought them on board and the success in the role, et cetera. I mean, have you seen examples of Six Sigma applied to that kind of data? I have seen some examples uh, of Six Sigma projects applied to that kind of data. And it's an extremely interesting situation to be in because 
very often in these transactional situations, we follow our gut feel, we follow our emotion, we follow our, and I, I've done this so often in my experience, this is what drives success in that transactional process. And then when you start to really define the things that you can measure and then really uh, start gathering that data, making sure that that data can be trusted, it is actually really true, the numbers that you get might be completely off. And it gives you fantastic clues on really defining what are the, the, the causes and what are the effects in the outcome of this process. And you can, you can see um, new ways of making sure you have a, a higher success rate than you had ever imagined. So yeah, Six Sigma can definitely be used in these transactional processes and can absolutely cause breakthrough improvements to happen. Excellent. That's thought provoking. And, uh, you know, I already think of some of the process challenges we have in some of our transactional processes to, to Mark's point, probably easier to talk about as transactional processes. And I can already think of some examples in our own company where we could apply this, this kind of thinking and this kind of approach. So that's, that's great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Edwin. So if, if, if I think about this, you know, We've talked about Six Sigma, but there's this, this thing called Demaic, um, and there's Design for Six Sigma, which Mark talked for, uh, talked about. Sorry. So, what what is Demaic, Nick? What is DFSS, and and are the two similar? And you know, how does that relate to Six Sigma? Well, one of the things I always say about DMAIC is that it drives excellence in project management. So uh, DMAIC, define, measure, analyze, improve, and control. And when when, when executing a, a Six Sigma project, DMAIC is, is, is your skeleton. Uh, it, is the, it is the foundation of, of how you were uh, to, to structure your Six Sigma project, starting with the, the defining of the problem, uh, measuring then the data that's been collected, analyzing that data through statistical analysis, uh, arriving at a uh, an appropriate improvement based on that analysis, and then putting in a robust control plan to ensure that the problem never comes back. Um, so, not doing DMAIC and and doing a Six Sigma project is something that that you can't do. You, you have to do them both uh, at the same time. One of the things that, that I've always been interested in and that I've always kind of watched from afar is folks that I've trained or, or individuals I've seen working on a Six Sigma project that maybe aren't working on a project in an area that they work with on a day-to-day -day basis really benefit from the rigor and the structure of the MAG. So, for example, if, if an engineer has a, a project that he or she is working on in an area that's outside the scope of, of their daily duties, it's in a, maybe another part of the manufacturing facility, they don't have much familiarity with it, yet they're working on a Six Sigma project in that area, DMAIC gives them the structure that they need to work through that project effectively and be a good project manager as they work through the Six Sigma project. They don't know much about the process, the define phase is exactly what you need to help understand what the process is, where the problem lies, and uh, what are the, the, the goals that need to be achieved in order for the project to be successful. If you don't know much about the process as well, you really don't know much about the data. So the measure phase, again, is really important for everyone to understand what type of data is at hand in the process. And analyze, improve, and control, all of these things are done um, with your project team. Uh, again, even, even more impactful for an individual who maybe isn't hands-on in a particular process on a day-to-day -day basis. Using their team as they work through the analyze and improve phase, uh, again, gets them more intimate with the process and the project that they're working on. And then control, obviously, one of the most uh, important aspects of the entire journey a, a, a solid, robust control plan to ensure that the problem never comes back again. Control is is one of the more difficult phases throughout the MAC. Um, I would say uh, oftentimes it, it, it can be overlooked. Uh, and when it is overlooked, uh, results can be disastrous because the time we invest in a Six Sigma project uh, it can, can, can be a great, can be a great deal of time. And if the problem is allowed to sneak back again, 
um, it's not good. It's not healthy for the organization to say we invest this time in this process, yet we still solve the problem, come back. Again, a reason why the control phase is so very important. So again, like I always say, uh, DMAIC drives excellence in project management. Again, completely different than from uh, from the design from Six Sigma realm, but uh, perhaps Mark, you'd be best to, to speak for design to Six Sigma. Great, thanks. Fantastic answer, Nick, and also a really good way of passing the ball off to uh, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> well, so so the way I look at it is um, where Demaic works, or where Demaic is, is needs to be applied, is if you were to look at your process and strip out all the all the variation that comes from things you can control. That's what your that's what your your best operate or your best option for that process or the best performance for that process is. So all the tools of Demaic and stuff are trying to remove that variation, get the process centered, and and live with the process you have. Well, if you've got a process that even after you've stripped out all of that uh, controllable variation is still not acceptable. That's when DFSS comes into into play because you have to define a new process, and so it's it's used mainly in new product development or new service development things like that. But it but the 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 sort of the when do I run and when do I use DFSS versus when do I use Demaic is if that underlying process isn't capable of meeting what I need for the customer. Then I'm going to have to redesign it, and that's where the 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 similar but somewhat different tools of DFSS come to be, come into bear. So. Great. So I guess in that case, Mark, you will use any data uh, and know how that you have from existing processes with similar type of attributes, and and very yeah, you'll find that in to a new process. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, one of the things we stress is. You know, people will sit there and say, "Well, I'm make, do it, I'm designing something new. I have no idea what the capability is going to be." Probably 80% of what you're designing is is similar to process products or processes you're already running. Go into the factory, get those capability data, take them back to the design folks, and say, "This is the capability you have to work with. Design around this." And um, and so we've you know, there are things like uh, capability databases, things like that, that people have put together to help folks that are doing design for Six Sigma understand, say, what the factory capability is or the state of the art is on the, on these processes. So you, you don't end up specifying something with an extremely tight tolerance that nobody's going to be able to build. And so that's the uh, that's that's one of the. The, the uses of, it, of the available data that you have when you're going into designing something new that's uh, that's a that's a really what's well, a key part but it's also a very powerful part of design for six sigma brilliant thank you I appreciate the uh, the follow-up there mark that uh, that that really helped I think for the listener to to understand that better great well, listen I've got a lot more questions I want to ask you all but um we've got to the point in the the show where we we find out a little bit more about our uh, our guests in terms of you know a fun fact about them. Um, so I, I was going to let Edwin off the hook, but he really gave me an enigmatic answer when I asked him um, did he already have something prepared. So he, he he already has something prepared. So I'm going to ask Edwin what's what's your latest fun fact. My latest fun fact is uh, well I'll, I'll I'll need to work the work into it, but my office smells like popcorn. And there's a good reason for it. Um, and, th and the reason is everything to do with improvement and Demaic. And um, when, when we talk about root cause and finding things uh, that, that we really want to eradicate, the best way to eradicate is put in place a poker yoke de device, something that really makes it impossible for the wrong state to occur. And nowadays, in many of our factories, we've got 3D printers. And people just love 3D printers, and so do I. You you design something, you can you can print it in a couple of hours, test it out, fine tune it, and make sure that your Poka Yoka device is exactly how you want it to be at relatively low cost, and you can have it all in house and in hand. So 
like I said in the beginning, I started off as a mechanical engineer. I, I designed things, and it's still my hobby. So what I did when I saw these 3D printers, obviously I bought one. Um, I've got one sitting in my office, um, and then I realized, well, we need to take care of the environment, right? I can't just you know, uh, make it spit out plastics and, and be polluting all the time. So I print everything <laughs> in PLA plastic, and PLA plastic is based on corn starch. And if you print at 200 degrees Celsius, cornstarch starts to smell like popcorn. So in the background, when we do these recordings, secretly, my 3D printer is making nice little devices to be able to put up my phone or to be able to do something with my telescopes uh, to, to shield out the sun, for instance, when I want to view solar flares. And all the time, there's this really nice smell that makes me hungry of popcorn. <laughs> It sounds like you're torturing yourself on purpose, Edwin. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, but it's just so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. Thank you for sharing that. I think that was another great example. Um, Nick, what can you tell us about yourself that we might not already know? Well, I think, I think those who, who do know me know that I am a, I am a huge motor racing enthusiast, uh, and I have viewed auto racing at over... 275 different auto racing venues across the globe, uh, predominantly in North America, some in Europe, uh, road courses, street courses, paved ovals, dirt ovals, 275. And I'm a member of a, a global club, Track Chasers is, is what it's called. And the goal is to see as, as many different types of motor racing circuits as you can across the world. And uh, I'm 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 not the best because the, some of the guys in the club are up in the 1000s of uh, different racetracks that they've seen. So I've got a long way to go, but uh, it's all rooted in travel. My love for travel. Uh, I, I love to see uh, different areas uh, across the country, across the globe, different cultures. So that's why I do it is because of my love of travel. I like racing too a lot, but I really love to travel more than anything. <laughs> Excellent. Oh, that's a really nice, Nick. And I, I do remember you telling me that you've uh, already pre-informed all your friends and family that if they ever organise a wedding or any other event during the Indy 500, you won't be there. So uh, I, I that, know that's, how you are. <laughs> that's right. I, but my line is always, don't die or get married uh, Memorial Day weekend in the U.S. It's the Indianapolis 500, and I will not be at your funeral or your wedding. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you've you've won them well. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Nick. Thanks. And Mark, what what can you uh, what can you assign us with? <laughs> so 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 I think starting 18 years ago, my um, my wife started giving me birthday cards that made fun of my age. And the first one was a group of kids looking out the back end of a school bus making faces. And it was, youth is fleeting. And you open up the card and it says, but immaturity can last forever. Right. <laughs> so that was the first one. The most recent one was, they say with age comes wisdom. And you open up the card and it says, which probably explains why people think you're younger than you are. So this is so these these cards have gone on every year. I got her back once and I found one that was don't be upset that you're a year older. And you open it up and it says be upset that some of your childhood toys are now worth thousands of dollars. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. They say a sense of humor is a success factor in a marriage. So obviously, uh your wife's working hard at yours. <laughs> she find, where she finds these cards, I don't know, but she always finds one. So, brilliant, brilliant. That's that's great. So, thank you. I think that's uh, it's always nice to hear these little tidbits from uh, from each of the guests. So, thank you for sharing that. Great. Well, listen, let's jump back in then. So, I think um, one one. I think the next question for me is one of these very interesting ones. Uh, Mark, I know you see these. Uh, popping up on our LinkedIn feeds uh, on a regular basis, which is Lean versus Six Sigma. And then somebody has got this infographic that tells us what Lean is, what Six Sigma is, and never the twain shall meet. Yeah. Um, and and it, it's I, I find them uh, infuriating and very simplistic. But um, so I'll, I'll ask you a, an infuriating and simplistic question then. So which is best, Six Sigma or Lean, Mark? Yes. 
<laughs> I was going to add some no, Mark. <laughs> so, so, so really, both, all of these things lie on a continuum of problem solving. And it's and it's using the right method for the right problem. So so we've been talking about data rich problems where where you may not know what the causes are, and so you need to you need to understand those data. You need to understand the uh, variables, and that's where Six Sigma comes in. Lean Lean is always to me. I mean, and Lean uh, to me is also more of an overarching. I'm, I hate to say philosophy, but but basically an approach to doing things. And, but but lean is more around the logic, around uh, the logic tools, those sorts of things. And so they're they're on this continuum. You need both, but you need to know also when to apply which set of tools. Uh, and because not everything is a Six Sigma project, not everything's a lean project. And so I think uh, yeah, I, I'd still say the answer is yes. So. <laughs> And I think that's the problem, isn't it? And we could get onto this probably a whole different episode of the podcast that we could do on this because, you know, that that's the issue, isn't it? You know, if you look at how Jack Welch used um, used it at GE, it was more of a strategy, uh, or even you could say a philosophy around how he was running GE, um, mm-hmm. and there was a lot more to it than just running domain projects. It was about how he built his leaders, how he set expectations on problem solving. Etc. Motorola was similar. Whereas at the very basic level, you know, there's people who just have the Six Sigma toolkit and they run domain projects every time there's a problem to be solved. And it's similar with Lean, isn't it? You can talk about Lean as a very simplistic toolkit that's used to get rid of waste. Um, or you can, as we're trying to do in GK Aerospace, you can have a Lean operating model, which is a whole philosophy of how you run your business. Um, to deliver operational excellence and I find this is one of the challenges when you have conversations with people you're not quite sure what their perspective is when you use mm-hmm. the term lean or, or six sigma what what do you think about that Nick what's your perspective on this yeah it, I mean I, I guess there's a reason why when when you would do a, a value stream design event that it would would birth a six sigma project or two and and there's a reason why when when you're in the middle of a lean initiative, uh, whatever that might be, that 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 might birth a Six Sigma project or two. So, yeah, you know, to to, to Mark's point, they're they're very 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 much hand in hand, and uh, and, and opportunities uh, will 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 pop when 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 applying lean to a process or different processes, um, and those opportunities might come in the form of a Six Sigma project. So, I, absolutely, I think you got to have both. I think companies uh, who who employ both uh, really do find the benefit and, and a well-rounded uh, area of, of applying problem solving, not just in the lean side, but also the advanced problem solving side that comes out of Six Sigma. Yeah, absolutely. It's probably a little bit like asking a mechanic, is the spanner or the screwdriver better? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, brilliant. But yeah, I'm, I must admit, I, I find it very infuriating when I see these simplistic Lean versus Six Sigma infographics. They get the great clickbait. They get loads of likes and comments, but um, I'm not sure how educational they actually actually are. So, so Edwin, I guess that that puts me onto a question, which is, how can Six Sigma be used most effectively? Ah, so that's a very interesting question because it differs. But in general, if you take a look at what we do within Six Sigma Demaic, um, you do a sort of a prep cycle. Um, that basically gives you all the information you need to define an improvement. So the define stage, the measure phase, the analyze phase, they're all information gathering phases. And then you go into your your, uh, improve phase and you're defining the improvement you want to do. You want to do your pilot to prove that it works and then you want to implement that improvement. Now, the most effective way of doing that, to me, is organizing a Kaizen event in a limited amount of time to do your pilot and then to install and scale it to the extent that you need it. So with that, um, then the uh, the borders between the lean approach and the Six Sigma approach actually disappear. If you take a look at it from a little bit of a a distance, to me, the most effective way is to plan uh, in terms of a prep cycle and a Kaizen event for implementation. And then your 90 day follow up uh, sequence of your Kaizen event becomes your control plan. 
the actual installation and see through of your control plan. So the most effective way to do it is to do it in lean way. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. I appreciate that, Edwin. Again, though, it's uh, it is once again, what are we talking about when we talk about lean? And uh, I, I perfectly understand what you're you're saying there. But it's great. It's good, good, uh, good guidance there. So I guess as we we progress towards the end of this, I think um, this is a question I'd like to kind of ask ask all three of you, and and maybe you can build on each other's answers. Let's uh, let's start with you, Mark. What are the do's and don'ts of Six Sigma? So so one of the don'ts is um, not everything is a Six Sigma project. Um, so you know we talk about this continuum of problem solving, and so it's um, yeah not everything's not everything Six Sigma. Uh, one of the do's is measurement system analysis. You have to, I've seen so many Six Sigma projects derailed by people not having a good uh, way of measuring the measuring the, the variables and stuff that they're they're actually working with. And then finally, I'd say the the la the other don't is the, you'll hear about the 1.5 sigma shift. Don't get wrapped around that axle. Um, you know, it's it's a it's a useful tool, but it's it's not something in stone. It's not something that, frankly, you need to worry all that much about as you as you go into doing your six sigma stuff. So, those are ones I would I would put on the list. So, yeah, great, great, Mark. And I guess that's. Um... You know, when you talk about not getting wrapped around the axle and something like that, there's this is this this real balance between it being a very practical way of solving a problem and it becoming a science project, right? Um, yeah. Certainly in the real world, you know, we we want to solve problems, we want to solve them thoroughly and properly, but it it can't be to the point that you know we're getting stalled because we're trying to do it to the nth degree. Um, mm -hmm. Thanks. And um, what about yourself, Nick? What What are your do's and don'ts? Uh, I I think my number one, my my do, is you have to start with a culture that is willing to embrace this. Um, you know, for me, the the people aspect of all of this, whether it be senior leadership or the individuals that we're training or or executing the projects, the, the, the buy in has to be there. Uh, they they have to want to do this. Senior leadership wants to 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 invest the time. And the effort into this and the individuals executing the project also need to to want to do this so it's definitely the one of the do's is is start with a uh, accepting culture uh, i think my other do is uh, uh kind of like I, I mentioned earlier embrace the mac uh the mac itself is very powerful use the steps as they are as they are written with define all the way through to control um, so I guess that kind of bleeds into a, to a don't is is don't make assumptions. Um, you know, even if you are very familiar with with the product or the process, still use to make in the in the manner it's it, it was designed for. Um, if if you do that, you're you're going to find some of the preconceived notions that you may have held. Uh, maybe aren't true, right? You know, Mark talked about the measurement phase. How many times have we seen someone say, my measurement system is good. I know it's good. We've been using it for the past 20 years. Why do I need to spend time doing a gauge R&R &R attribute agreement analysis? It, that's that's dangerous rhetoric, right? So so using DMAIC, stepping through the steps is is very, very important. Um, I guess my, my other don't then as as all that's being said is is don't make assumptions with without data uh obviously six sigma is is very very data rich if done correctly and and again one of the pitfalls can be making the assumptions uh based on experience based on familiarity with the product or process and uh and ignoring what the data is telling us we talked earlier that data is the way that our our processes speak so uh so listen to it and, and, and don't make assumptions uh, b before truly understanding what our processes are telling us. Brilliant. Thanks very much there, Nick. And yeah, you re-emphasized the, the debate part of it, which we didn't really follow up on when you brought that up earlier in the, the episode. And I think that's really an important thing that you're emphasizing there. DMAIC is a, it's effectively a project management tool, but it guides you through. It's that vehicle to do a Six Sigma project really, really well. And uh, yeah, you've 
you've emphasised that a couple of times. So I wanted to add weight to that because I think it's it's such an important point that you've raised. So Edwin, what what do y'all do's and don'ts? Uh, don't do a project in isolation. If you're the black belt, people look at you and and uh, they are gonna assume you know it all. You know how to do it, and you're gonna make this happen. You're not. You need those people that understand the process. You need that multifunctional team of people that give you input from all different angles on what could be causing the issue, where could we take a look, and how together can we make this to a success. The other one is also a don't. Don't do it in the office. You cannot solve project problems behind a a computer working through the statistical models without actually understanding what happens in real life. So the do's become the opposites of these, right? Work with the people that understand the process. Work with those operators that have run that process for 20 years and challenge them, but also be challenged by them and, and have that interaction with them. And be on the shop floor, be on the area where that process runs. If it's a transactional process, be there where the transactional steps are being made and view and experience and feel why that process is running as much as why it is not running. I think those are extremely, extremely important uh, uh, things to, to keep in mind. And finally, don't get hung up in the statistics. You can you can go down a rabbit hole really fast. Get some help if you're stuck. There's plenty of people that know the statistics. Um, absolutely. I think you, you brought some great points there, Edwin. Anyway. I think the one that I really want to um, pick up on is, you know, you, you didn't use this language, but it's kind of looking at black belts as the expert who's going to solve the problems. Uh, I think, you know, some organisations, I won't name organisations, but I think some organisations have created almost a masters of the universe type of approach with the black belts where, you know, it's kind of, oh, there's a problem to solve. Here he comes with his underwear over his trousers and, you know, and a cape. And, and, and you know, that's that's the kind of the, the solution to all the problems. And I guess building capability in the organisation is so important, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely agree. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Right. So we're, um, we're kind of really at, at the end now. So it, it probably links a bit to the do's and don'ts, but... You know, if you want to kind of summarize what you've brought to this today and, and give some advice to anyone who wants to to start using Six Sigma or become a certified green belt or black belt, you know, if you summarize your your you know what you've brought to the table today, what how would you give advice, Edwin, to uh, to anybody who wanted to to start using Six Sigma? I think if you want to start using Six Sigma, it can be quite overwhelming. There's all these tools, and many of them are quite complex and people will will give you complex issues don't be afraid get stuck in get that really big one and that's going to be your certification vehicle because if it's the big one the organization really needs it they're going to support you and that's the only way you're going to really learn and learn how to do the make learn how to use these tools and learn that it actually works if you follow the recipe because sig sigma is a fantastic approach it is a fantastic methodology and to make is a beautiful recipe that if you answer all the questions that are prescribed in the phases and you're you can trust the data the answer will come and you can solve that problem um, and with that you can really tell everyone you've earned that certification so go for it go for the big one excellent thanks very much Edwin. great great advice and nick what would your advice be yeah, I, I guess mine would be, uh, you know, truly want to do it. Uh, if if you want to take the, the Six Sigma certification journey, whether it be green belt or black belt, really, really want it. Want it not only for the organization, but but want it for yourself. Um, it, it can change the trajectory of your career. It did mine. Uh, again, like I said, I was an operator working on a factory floor and I was introduced to this concept. So it's uh, it is something that you can carry with you throughout the rest of your career. I, I truly believe it changes the way you uh, you think about problem solving. Um, and, and once you reach the certification, um, continue to use these tools throughout the rest of your career. You know, maybe you won't sit down and do a, a, a six month Six Sigma project every other every other six months, 
but you very well might lean back on on many of the tools that were introduced to you through the Six Sigma training. You might use those throughout your daily duties and throughout your career. Um, it, but again, you, you, you have to want to do this. Uh, you have to want to change uh, your, your thought process on on how you problem solve currently versus how you might begin to problem solve after you get uh, Six Sigma training. Sometimes that's difficult for folks, especially folks who are subject matter experts, folks that are, are very familiar with their processes, uh, that are used to making uh, improvement decisions on the fly right away. Six Sigma tells you to slow down a little bit consider and evaluate and analyze the data and make uh, intelligent decisions on those improvements. So you have to be ready to, to perhaps have this challenge the way you problem solve now and accept that your problem solving techniques are probably going to change after your exposure to Six Sigma. So again, like I said, want to do it and uh, embrace how it's going to change you as a problem solver uh, from, the, from the moment you get certified on. That's that's great. I really appreciate that the way you've emphasised that, Nick, and uh, you know the story about you know changing the way that you think, your thought process. Uh, a good friend of the show, David Bovis, he talks about how we're not changing people, we're changing brains, and we're changing the way that the neurons are wired and fired. Um, and and that's essentially what you're talking about here. How it's going to change the wiring pattern of your brain so that when you encounter problems in the future you're going to tackle them differently. So, yeah, I, lo I love the way you described that, Nick. Thank you. And then last but not least, Mark, what, what would your advice be? So if somebody starting into this, I'd say, first of all, you know, get good training and get it, you know, and take it seriously. And, and one of the main parts of taking that seriously is you're going to have a project as you go through training. Keep up with the keep up with the project as you go through training. Finish finish that project, and when you pick that project, um, there was a guy I used to work with in the early days of Six Sigma used to say when we were talking about uh, projects for training, you learn to ski on a slope called Meadow, not on one called Havoc, right? So pick something that's 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 fairly simple that you can get done in a reasonable amount of time and, and demonstrate to yourself and demonstrate to the folks around you that you can do the, um, that you can do the methodology. You can actually go through the full Demaic. You can, um, you can get a result that's worthwhile for the business, that sort of thing. So, so start, you know, get trained, start simple and, and build, build your competence up as you go um, through, through more projects. So. That's great. Thank you. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, uh, Nick, Edwin and, and Mark. I think you've brought really some great ideas, some great thinking, some great experience to this. We we promised in the abstract that we brought three eminent guests and masters in this field. And I think you've proven me to be right on that. So um, I, I really do appreciate it. And, and to the listeners there, I hope you've really enjoyed this episode. And remember, it's about changing how you lead, not who you are.